do you classify for the ball change? And then what are you doing to that person's career? I guess just us discussing it like this, uh, I'm, I'm already changing my view. Well, this morning we so grateful and, and how honoured we are, uh, Arthi, me and you this morning to, to sit with Luan and Luan. What a privilege, what an honour for us here and exciting for us to also get a coach's perspective today. Um, it's a growing capacity, but I think there's also some uh, confusion around coaching and whether it offers benefit or not. You know, Arthur and I was briefly speaking this morning and saying, you know, I don't have a single mate that goes to coaching as an example really? in my golf um, uh, group. group. And it, it's obviously that there's still massive potential then for coaching and mm. etc. But just to brag a little bit of who we've got here this morning, he has coached five different Sunshine Tour order um, order of merit winners. He's also coached five European Tour and DP World Tour winners, and he's been the coach of the year in South Africa, PGA coach of the year twice. So that's uh, quite an achievement, uh, Llewellyn, for you to sit here this morning. Welcome and thank you very much for your time. Thanks. So much. Thanks. You know, I looked at the players that you guys coach, that you coach specifically, and I can envision for us how interesting this is going to be for people because we'll pop their names and their faces on as we speak about them um, or glance over them. And um, I think people are going to find it so interesting. Um, and also, people are interested in the text background um, mm -hmm. of yours. And, and today you find yourself at the Bryanston uh, um, Driving Range Academy. Yes. Am I saying that the right way? Well, I think it's called the Bryanston Country Club. The Bryanston. My, my apologies. With a double E. <laughs> 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 but we also share a club, uh, Llewellyn. I've been there for about 14 years or something like that. So we also share a club. So um, I um, I hope we don't carry a snobbish um, reputation. No, but no. The, Br the Bryanston Country Club was certainly relevant 15 years ago when I joined. You yeah. know, it was quite a stuck-up club. And I know that management has come in and just made tremendous growth. Mm. Um, and it really is today, in my opinion, one of the top three facilities clubs. Oh, definitely. Uh, no doubt about that um, in the country. Mm. Even that pro shop that they have there, yeah. that, um, they've done is unreal. The unreal. amount of equipment and offerings yeah. and service they can provide is also... And I mean, with Ulrich's background, his, yeah. his experience, it's, mm. it's actually amazing what they offer the members there. Yeah. For me, I think it's definitely one of the top pro shops, on-course pro shops mm. in the country as well. For certain. Which yeah. is great, great uh, offering for the members as well. Yeah, but you also surround yourself now with the Titleist National Fitment Centre. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. on your right. And then you've also got the pro shop's got a fitting centre on the left of it. Um, and then the driving range, obviously, for all the members. And then the coaching in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to LJ yesterday, she's, um, um, she says to me, she, what a game changer it is to be under roof. Yes. Oh, yeah. Under roof. She says it's like she couldn't believe what a game changer it was. And, and obviously her now going to um, De Zalza, mm -hmm. there is none of that facilities. And one of the points she mentioned to me is like, I just, I'm not looking forward to going Back into the sun. Back into the sun. Uh, and, and, and wind and rain in, in, in Stellenbosch, when it rains and winds there, it's certainly not a, a nice place to be on the golf course. Um, no. But thank you very much again. Yeah, I think um, she's going to have a couple of elements she's going to have to avoid, especially with the Cape Town weather, all the wind and rain. Can't Shame I think that. she's so excited. Uh, I mean, her, her partner lives down in Correct. Somerset West, so I think, you know... If it's just going to simplify her life, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for her. Great place to move down, eh? Listen, we said yesterday, you know, it feels like that's the new immigration. <laughs> <laughs> You're not immigrating to you Australia. You have water and electricity. Yeah, you've got water and electricity and a, and a somewhat uh, better functioning government. Um, and there's no doubt about it when you go down to Cape Town. I mean, what a beautiful destination mm. that we have there. Um, but for golf, it is very different than it is towards Joburg. There's no doubt about that. It's a very different environment we find ourselves there in. But Llewellyn, you here with us this morning. I'm sure a lot of people are far more interested in you this morning than me and Arthur. But um, coaching. The relevance of coaching today. Now, 
Arthur and I tap into fitting uh, and where we feel fitting is just at the starting point at the mm. moment. It really does feel to me that for the first time the education around fitting, now extending it not just to club and driver but more ball, your shoe mm. fitting. You know, um, people are understanding the concept now better of I'm hitting the ball far more than I am my driver. Mm. So where is the focus point supposed to be? And it feels to me, and I'm, I'm only a short while in the golfing industry, it's the f the most attention that fitting to me is getting it that it's ever had in my personal mm. small little experience in golf, and it's not just an emotion; it's an investment that we can see across the country, uh, facilities being upgraded, new technologies that are being used, and etc. And I say that because what's your view on coaching and where it is and, and the opportunity that it still has? I just want to elaborate something quickly while he was chatting about the fitting. I'm sure if a guy's got fitted for golf clubs. I'm sure it makes your job a lot simpler because if he has the wrong equipment, mm. the ball's going all o all over the place. I mean, it you puts saw a that lot of pressure on you whether the lie angles are wrong or the shaft is wrong or something mm. is wrong because now your customers are looking for results. But if your equipment is not giving you results, it almost makes you look bad in a mm. sense because you can only control the technical aspect in a sense to a capacity and you want to control the golf ball element to that as well, w which is connected to the golf clubs. Mm. I mean, I, I think what, what's, you know, my, my history at Tux, we had all the specialists, all the various specialists, and, and yes, we had titles involved there doing a fitting for each of our clients yearly, but it wasn't as it is now where you're working with the fitters on a daily basis. So I can literally have a client where he's had a fitting for a swing that needs to change. Mm. I mean, uh, I mean, a fitter can only be as, as good as the consistency that the player produces. Mm. I mean, if he's going to be inconsistent with what he produces, th there's no fitter in the world that can help him. So it's been really good to have the fitters um, alongside us and, um, you know, we can make subtle changes to their club that um, help Benefits them with... Yes, change. exactly. It helps them with the changes that we try and make. But yeah, I think with fitting, it's... It's like the world today, it's instant gratification. You can change your game instantly. Mm. Where with coaching, it's more long-term and it's, you know, you want to work on a plan. And I think even coaching has changed so much that, you know, you can get down to the root cause of the problem a lot easier than, say, 10 years ago. Mm. Especially with technology. Exactly, and yeah. yeah. And the coaching f philosophy, I mean, if you... <laughs> You know, there's, there's standardization, you know, a, around the world. But more and more people are understanding that individual swings play a vital role. Mm. You know, what type of habit you maybe created when you were younger or if you're a later player in, 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 in life, I suppose that will be a more of a standardized coaching. But we all, we all have a different angle of our swing. We all have different techniques. Mm. Some of it we learn from coaching. Some of it we get from tips uh, on YouTube. That's the biggest killer, really. I, I, I tell you, it's a subject. I think yeah. we could literally, we, we could talk literally about that go onto that episode. because y you can find millions of, of, of videos, context, yeah. Instagram, TikTok. It doesn't matter where you go, you'll find tips and tricks. And many times you get caught with it. Where and simple doesn't sell, does it? No, no, it doesn't. But so, so maybe tell us your perspective on all of this. I think it's one of the biggest jobs that I have is to get into my player's brain or mind as to what he believes the swing should function based on what he's read, not read, watched on YouTube mostly. Um, there's so many bad um, advice videos out there that really the biggest job is to just understand, okay, what is this guy actually trying to do that's hurting him? Um, and then obviously the, you know, the, the, the experience that I had with working with Gavin Groves and, and Garth Milner, some of the best um, fitness specialists in the game, you know, understanding how the body will influence what the player is able to do, you know, it, it all is, it's just become a lot simpler to try and get to a, a simple plan for that player, and and the, the improvements have been a lot faster. Like, you know, you can you can literally now change a player's swing within a month, where before guys would rock up at the golf course and say, please excuse me because I'm working on a few things and you look at the oak and it's 
that still looks exactly the same. He's just going down all these rabbit holes of, of swing thoughts and, and then it's this tip, that tip, but it doesn't work. And we see this as no reference point. So I think when we all grew up in golf, the idea of training golf would be go and hit driving range balls like mad. Mm. Go from there to the tripping range, then from there. Then Hogan, VJ Singh, kind of. There, yeah. there we being go. Being a range rat. Correct, being a range rat. But what we have found now also is that there has to be some practice with purpose philosophy in it too. Mm. Where the professional players we've had on here that's reached top 100s in their lives are, I'd rather hit 80 to 120 balls with purpose, with mm. some sort of plan, with an outcome, than a thousand balls on the day, randomly creating shit habits. Yeah, and I mean, invariably, if you're hitting 500 golf balls, you are going to go down some rabbit holes because just it's just human nature to react to the, the results that you are getting instantly. Um, I think what lockdown taught us is that people practicing into a net, you know, when you're working on technique, it's far better for you not to even see the see. results so that you can repeat um, good reps and not get caught up in the emotions of the result rather than focusing inwardly on, on what you are trying to repeat. And, and yes, that doesn't take thousands of reps. It just, I mean, the, the, the body doesn't have, the, the, the brain has memory. The body doesn't have memory. So you just need to remind the brain, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to do. And you just have to remind it a lot of, a lot of times, not, not necessarily quantity wise, but, three times a day, four times a day, five times a day, do 10 reps. And I find that that's helped people change their habits a lot faster. And what have you seen if you look at at coaching at the moment? I mean, what is the typical people that come to you? So there's two aspects to your coaching. It's the professional side, which we'll dive into just in a bit. But then the average amateur that comes to you, mm. how does that process start? What is he coming for? Well, so, I mean, most most people when they come for coaching, it's it's to fix a department. So if it's, you know, your first job is to really f dive into, okay, which department will change your scoring the fastest? Because the, the quicker you can have results and in terms of scoring, yeah. um, the, the faster that person will buy into what plans uh, you have for him. So that's that's the first job is to, to determine what, department to work on um when it's working on long game it's a little bit more complicated you you, you really want to dive into some pressure mat numbers you want to dive into some 3d um you know what is his feet doing to help him uh to achieve what his body wants to achieve and what is the body doing to help him deliver the club the way he wants to and all those things are measurable. All those things you can actually quantify and, and you can see if I'm changing X, does it actually make the numbers change? Not, It's not emotional. It's not It's not me telling you, it's oh, that's much better. I think in the past, it's just like the golf coaches were psychologists. Um, now they're becoming a lot more sport, sports scientists. Uh, yeah, yeah so that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And the, when you say small wins, because we want instant gratification, we live in that yes. world, so you sort of go where the lowest hanging fruit is. Yes. But just from a practical perspective, we, when you're in the gym, so let's say you train, then a coach gets involved, as an example, a month into it. When you sit on equipment, they make small adjustments, like, listen now, but your back just needs to go back mm. a little bit. Your arms needs to straighten out. And what they're actually saying to you is that there's a form that you have to stick to because exactly. otherwise you're going to create problems and injuries and etc. Yeah, and I think that's what people or coaches make the mistake of doing is they get they dive into technique straight away, but and they avoid the basics. Exactly. It's I mean basics. Listen, I'm not a qualified coach. I've seen many coaches through my golfing career, and I think guys forget about the basics which is a lot more crucial so it's, it's grip alignment posture it's everything etc like you can have the best looking swing in the world mimicking tiger mm -hmm. woods but if your grip is bad promise you there's no club face stability at impact i mean i, I think one of the f things that most players fight is early extension or, or the, where the pelvis is moving mm. closer to the ball 
but I just find that that is just mostly fixed by having the correct posture at address correct. and the correct balance at correct. address and those things you can actually measure now. Um, Controlling your weight transfer a bit better. Yeah, well, if you're dynamic to start with, then you, you can use your feet. So and in an athletic position, technically. Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at a guy like Matt Fitzpatrick, for instance, if he does his speed training, his club moves very different to his normal golf swing. His normal golf swing is very static, you know, just turns the pelvis, the, the club goes behind him in the takeaway. But when he does his speed training, the club goes back a lot straighter, yes. naturally. It's not that he's trying to change his technique, I believe. I think it's just because he's trying to get the most out of the speed. And I think speed training, along with um, being able to measure, has made peop people swing better naturally. Mm. Just a bit more freer. Yeah, like a lot more like other sports. You know, if you liken it to cricket or tennis or paddle even, like, mm. uh, you know, most s rotational sports just work the same. And we we have viewed golf as working differently. But I think it's also psych psychological. That, you know, you, you see the ball fly in the air and you think you are the one that makes it go in the air, but really it's the club that's built to get that ball in the air. So if you think about hitting a straight four in cricket or hockey, you're never trying to get the ball in the air. You're, you're trying to keep it on the ground. And that's what we see with professionals like you. Um, you know, the dynamic um, loft is always 10 degrees lower than the static Correct. loft. And I think that's the biggest misunderstanding generally in golf with amateurs. Let's explain what you guys just said there in layman's terms. <laughs> I think most people, when they or amateurs certainly, they, you see the ball flying in the air and therefore you think you are, you are the one that makes it go in the air. The club is built to get the ball in the air. You are actually throwing the energy downwards. If you look where the ball is in terms of where your hands deliver the, the club head from, that ball is down. So y you are actually not trying to hit the ball in the air. You're actually trying to hit the ball into the ground. Correct. A lot of a lot of better players have a stronger dynamic loft, hence why they hit it a lot further than the yeah. average golfer. Because you're making a seven iron theoretically a five iron. All it the just best improves players. your smash yes, so much. Correct. It gets the ball speed up. Um, I think actually all the best players in the world's dynamic loft is so good. You yeah. know, so ten degrees stronger. Ten yeah. degrees stronger dynamic loft, de-lofting the club face. Mm. Um, versus a lot of the amateurs tend to scoop it and try lift it, mm. um, and, and you actually need to let the loft of the golf club and the golf club get the ball in the air. Yeah. So it's quite simple. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not a complicated theory. And now that the camera is off, I don't know if this <laughs> is going to work. <laughs> we'll, keep, we'll keep you in voice. Um, but that's when we say, you know, when people look at a divot, uh, people think the divot starts before the ball no, the divots no. get scooped Starts way after way after yeah way after the contact of the ball um but that's a thing that not a lot of amateurs always realized you know and that's the concept in principle where you hit down onto the ball that's why the divot has to be created mm. let the loft do it and the pull through would be irrelevant because the ball would be struck by that point already i mean i, I coach a lot of golf or i coached a lot of golf in pretoria and if you look at the Pretoria Country Club members, you know, all their greens are small and they raised greens. You have a whole golf club full of yippers um, just simply because they, they're they trying to help the ball in the air with their chipping, yeah. as, as simple as that may be. Um, and that, to me, is the, the biggest. And it, and it just actually leads to so many other mistakes uh, in terms of speed. You're... You're not using your. You're not getting into that lead foot. So your lateral forces, your rotational forces. I mean, even your centrifugal force. When you throw the club down, there's a lot more centrifugal force at play than when you're staying low with the hands. Um, and that, all those things play a role with fitting the club correctly. If 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 the person's understanding of how the golf swing should work isn't correct, even the fitter will 
fit that guy with a club that doesn't suit him. It's time now, when you talk about Pretoria, let's just talk about Tux a little bit mm-hmm. uh, and your journey from there to Bryanston. He was Mr. Tux. Everyone knew him. Everybody. Mr. Tux. I'm sorry to <laughs> lay Everybody. You. But if someone says I'm at Tux driving range, I already know that they're seeing Llewellyn, which is a good statement. Yeah, I mean, to such a point when I found out you came into Bryant's and it was like almost a shock. It was a shock for me. I'm like, he's yeah. just left his 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 hub. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was there for 14 years, so I had really good experience there um, working with some of the top specialists and, and just, you know, working as a team rather than just an individual coach. I think in a lot of team setups, even today, um, each member on that team is really fighting for his own survival. Whereas at, at Tux, we had a, a, a team. There was a, a team fighting for for the same common goal, which was the, the player. Um, so that experience was very good. Um, but you know, we all we all get to a point where you need to challenge yourself again. And I just got to a point where I needed to start a new challenge. Um, the facilities, the the club at Bryanston, when that opportunity came uh, it was it was a no-brainer for me and today decision regrets good no regrets no i'm really loving coaching again it's you know i've had to pretty much start my business from the start um you know so marketing yourself on socials like all that stuff that you took for granted um having been at a at a facility for a long time so it's been it's been interesting and it's been it's been a lot of fun but Luan, that's a very important point. I mean, your credibility in coaching is just absolutely incredible. Uh, honestly, top five I- 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 in South Africa, and you still had the humility to say, I need to market myself again. You know, I can't just work on my credentials that I've had for 14 years or whatever time period it might have been. It's very impressive. And it's humbling, I suppose, to go through that particular thing to say, okay, how do I pivot a little bit here? How do I now need to market myself, build mm. up an entire client base? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, like my, my coaching, I think when I started coaching, I, I would have coached everyone for free. My, my friends always used to mock me and say, at what stage are you going to start charging <laughs> these big names? Um, but but that's what it's been for me is is just passion to help people improve. And I just try and focus on that um, and at the end of the day, word of mouth marketing is the most effective marketing. So if I can have fun doing what I do and actually improve the person that's in front of me, word of mouth will get its will way, work its way around. And, and it's worked. I mean, my diary is filling up very fast and I'm getting to a point now where I need to actually choose uh, what type of clients I want to service at which times. If you had to compare coaching professional golfers to just the average Joe? I think professional golfers are able to do what you tell them to do a lot easier. So professional golfers, it's 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 a very dangerous um, client to take on because he can actually do what you tell him to do. So you might help him down a hole if, you don't, if you're not careful. So, but it's basically the same basics it's the same simple message that you try and get through if you have ever played anything that's important to you you know that you have to keep things simple and that's what you need to try and do for a professional golf is is keep things as simple as possible work the same plan and make sure it's the right plan Mm. and how do you determine that because before we just go into that um, people that's been on your books, Dylan Fatelli, Brandon Stone, James Hart to Priya, George Kutsia, Sander Lombard, Dylan Naidu, Louis de Jager, Cassandra Alexandra, and Buchled Lamini. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've been really blessed with some very good clients. Um, I think in a lot of cases, coaches are reliant on how good their players are. So a lot of those names that you've mentioned, um, I think even with ba- a bad coach, they would be very good. But I think today, everything's a lot more measurable. Um, so you could have got away with average coaching 10 years ago because it's not measurable. Now, if you are saying to a person, I need I need your, he wants to hit a cut 
you, you need his horizontal plane to change to f- between four and eight left and it's whatever you're telling him to do to achieve this is not doing it he's not going to buy into your plan so I think it's it's a lot safer for people to take lessons now because it's so measurable and tell me when it comes to costing is there a different price structure between professionals and amateurs is there well i think historically you know i think the sunshine tour certainly in the last year or two has definitely grown massively especially in the ladies game so historically it was a case of trying to help these young players um, afford what they need not necessarily um, charge them for it so historically you would be charging your your professionals a percentage of their of their earnings which means initially that might mean nothing and then the benef- the benefits later when they do do really well uh, is very great but it's become a profession on its own now is to you know work on the tours um there's a lot of coaches that make a lot of money from from players on tour but it's a different ball game altogether I started at a club now. My focus is on servicing members, getting talented little youngsters um, into my programs and working a long plan with them. And well, hopefully down the line, I can change to working on the tours again. It was an exciting period of my career, but you know my kids are all going to high school now and I, I just really got to a point where I need, I'd, I'd rather now spend more time with them than on the road. So if you don't mind me just poking a little bit off uh, between Alexandra, um, which is Kaz, most people know mm-hmm. as Kaz, and the Buchle, but you are so right that they've just, boom, come onto the map in such a big way from a lady's perspective. And one, the coaches obviously has a big role to play in that, but really exciting that the tours are giving them a lot more airtime. And they also this excitement that they create. I mean, the shots that the ladies' tours are now doing, and the and the type of golf that they are playing mm. is just on another level. I mean, Cass is most certainly one of the most professional, and Nobuchle too, the most professional golfers that I've worked with. Um, you know, Cass tries to improve every little stone that she can turn to get better. She works, and she works really hard, and she works really smart. I mean, that girl can swing the club at 116 miles per hour and y- having worked with flight scope yeah, as long yeah, as you have, yeah. um, <laughs> there are a lot of men that cannot achieve this ever in their lives. I tell you, I was um, fortunate enough to play with her um, in a in a round of golf with two of my amateur friends and uh, not, the, not the nicest people either. And um, they just, she j- they just couldn't believe it. They almost stopped playing and just watched. Watched. Because the stuff that she can do with an iron and with a driver and yeah. the way that she was pushing the limits and op- they, obviously on that day, it was a little bit of, you know, let me show you what I can do. And it was just incredible to watch. Yeah, and I think w- with Cass, most certainly, and a lot of players, um, they are so well taught by the psychologists to be as positive and as have these great um, attitudes towards every part of their games that... It was actually her short game of late that has improved as much, um, and it's and it's. I think it's going to put her in a situation where she can actually compete at majors. Because um, when I saw a short game last year December, I was sorry, Cass, but I was horrified. Yeah. And and it's it's exciting what she can do with a wedge in her hand now, and yeah, she's going to be good that one. Did you do a bit of a post analysis on the last two big wins that they should did where where that strokes game came from? I think it's it's just her comfort levels just still working on the same plans. She's a phenomenal putter. Um her ball striking is obviously very good. Um but the like I said, the biggest change now is she's keeping those bogeys off the cards. Um she's always made a lot of birdies and and really her scrambling has certainly been the, the the biggest thing that's changed of late. Yes, like, I mean, it must be very exciting. Um, so I'm just speaking out loud here now because it has been absolutely incredible. Now, when you look at um, the coaching and 
you look at the future of it. What is your perspective on it? And, and just hear me out where I'm going with this. I want to speak a little bit about the economic dynamics within coaching in South Africa because I, I think a lot of people are seeing a lot of overseas coaches. It's a whole different ball in economy. Mm. But coaches are really the time and the respect that we need to give them in the sense of they don't, it's not a massive economy in South Africa. Am mm -hmm. I right or wrong? No, I think there's there's really only a, a, a handful of coaches that can make a proper living out of coaching. Um, I mean, any business that you are selling time is not really a great business to be in because there's no, there's no real passive income unless you are earning percentages of, of, of professionals. Um, but I think the future of, of coaching, um, it's become a lot easier, you know, with online lessons um, becoming quite a big part of coaching. Coaches are certainly able to um, manage their diaries so that their, their diaries are, at the end of it, very full because, you know, you're dealing with a diary from eight to five where people are working in the day. So you need people and clients that can keep your whole day busy. And that's the biggest challenge for coaches is everybody can sell their time out from three to six and on a Saturday. It's the, the challenge of selling your diary eight to three. You know, only the good ones will, will get that right. So that's interesting. I mean, because online coaching is obviously growing on a huge scale mm. around the world. What's the diff What's the split there? How's that grown for you from online coaching to in-person coaching? How's that changed it for you? It's fast growing. Yeah. Um, I've had to now change my online coaching model completely. I don't do live Zoom meetings or coaching sessions anymore. With apps like Sportsbox and Coach yeah. Now, yeah. people can load the information throughout the week. I then look at it on a Monday. I do all my feedback on a Monday. And Bryanston being closed on a Monday, it's basically helped me sell my diary out on a Monday. Yeah, because it's exactly the same. When I was younger, my, my dad was a, an, an attorney by practice. And one of the things he said to me, not to become an attorney because there's a roof and a limit. Yeah, I can only charge for so many hours within the day. Yeah. And obviously there's ways of scaling it, mm. like a coach taking on an academy and you replicate that through different coaches and you know have a structure of um, making a money out of them, as yeah. an example. But in South Africa... It's few and far between. Yeah, and I think the future of that, you know, if you are doing, if I did my job well at Tux, it was seeing the young coaches that I mentored become really successful in their own rights. And I think that for me has been a, a big success story f of my time at Tux. I think we've produced some some of the best coaches in Emil Steinman, Bradley Ninobers in Sydney, um, Carl Phelan is at Centurion. So those guys have been able to move on and, and really create some big business for themselves and, and become really successful in their own right. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's a very... You're not doing it to make money. It's 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 got to be passion. If you if you don't do it because of passion, you, you're going to get burnt and, and you won't last. But... I'm listening, if I'm listening to this, I mean, it's a scary thing, um, you know, to, to know that there's going to be limitations. What type of innovations are coming through on the coaching side where you can create a bigger economy? So I'll give an example, your social media presence that you have. Mm -hmm. How much is that yielding clients for you or is it reputation or w why do it? I also can interrupt on that. If you look at Asia, the uh, Asian market and coaching has just gone through the roof. Yes. In but person. From, well, in, in Asia, obviously, yeah. and in person, but from a t technolo technology mm. standpoint. So the gadgets that they have, the yeah. putting greens with... Um, Pud view. Pud view. view yeah. And I, th I saw the other day they've got this, like, swing robot. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it, yeah, but you so literally hold it and it looks like a robot. And you can and it's seen it, yeah. impersonate anyone's In swing. Correct, type of a thing. How does that... So obviously I'm not saying that is an example or a standard that they're trying to set. So do you think 
South Africa could head into that direction from a technology standpoint? Or do you think that's too complicated for South Africans? I think that it's it's reliant on big business backing coaches yeah, yeah. to start things like that. I do, um, I mean, I, I, I've spoken to Martin de Toy um, at length and, you know, certainly in America too, you can have a relationship with a club that goes really well for 10 years and then suddenly someone becomes the chairman and just doesn't like you and wants to get their own their friend or, yeah. coach to come in. So certainly in America, there's a lot more coaches starting their own little business enterprises away from the golf course at a, in a warehouse. Shohin Nakjavani, yeah. I mean, that oak, he prints cash coaching. And he only coaches online. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think at some stage it's going to get to that point. I think we're just always going to be a few years later than World Industries. But then online coaching, if if it's effectively and done in a well way, what it also does is opens the world to you, right? Exactly. Because there's really no difference in me sending data from Europe or America or Asia than there is from Pretoria to Bryanston. Well, I'm finding that you know, my evenings are now starting to get filled with American clients. Because of the time difference, I can now service them from six to nine. So it, it really gets to a point where you have to manage, manage your, what yeah. you take on. But like, how do they even make contact with you? Why? Is it through your social media? Word of mouth, I Word think. Mouth. I, have a okay. I have a lot of college clients, um, or college players playing college golf in America. Okay. Um, and people that have moved, that were clients here in person, that have moved to different countries and their word of mouth. And obviously your socials, like if someone is following you on your socials, it means they are watching what you're doing and trying to determine whether they like it or not. And I always see when I have a new follower, I mean, you don't watch them per follower, but you can see who keeps following the same stories and the same, and then three weeks down the line, they make contact and they want to know more and they they reach out and... And off it goes. Yeah, and, you know, you do that consistently over a long period of time, you're going to get to a point where your book is full. But, but that's a very important point because Arthur and I always... <laughs> I think social media, and if I say social media, forget the platform like Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. I'm talking about your physical presence in, online. Because one, you always want to say like, you know, well, what's the point? You know what I mean? I see enough people, I go through a thousand reels a day mm. as an example, and people are over it. People don't want to be sold to the whole time. So what I really like about your approach is that you put the information out there, you give your opinion on it, and people either buy into it or not. Yeah. Now, the coaches, if you if you think plays in South Africa from a professional perspective, because we don't we don't have great s digital presence from 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 players. Yes, they are there online. Yes, you can find them, but they you know it's not maybe every two three weeks they post. It's random post. There's yeah. no constructive strategy behind what they mm. do. Coaches in South Africa, except one, two, or three, really do very little. Mm. when it comes to their social media. They would take a picture of I'm on the course or the range today, but that that, that doesn't really do anything for you, um, you know, from, from, from learning something out of it or yeah. a call to action from it. I mean, if you look at George Gankus, what social media has done for him, I don't know if you know John, yeah. George yeah. Gankus. Yeah. Massive, uh, now he's got product that he's actually yeah. made mm. for, I wouldn't say his technique. <coughs> Even Sean Foley is yeah. 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 that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess it depends on what the specific coach's main product is. If online was my main product, then I would be a lot busier putting tips out there, mm. like a I'm Gankus sorry. or like a Shohin Nakjavani, I think is probably the, the, the biggest success story um, with, with online coaching. But, I mean, that that isn't necessarily what my outlook is i i want to work with people in person mostly i want to work with juniors and help them become champions like like i've done before with other players that's that's my passion and, and that's what i so when i put stuff out on socials it's really to 
let you know what I like to see. Yeah. And you can either then, mm, no, that's not for me, or I really like the stuff that he's, he's doing with his clients. So, Llewellyn, back to the technology change in coaching. Mm. Um, I know it's boomed in the last couple of years, especially after lockdown. You know, everything's gone online with tech and uh, systems in place. So, what systems do you use? Um, what if someone had to do like a full analysis or a long game analysis? Mm. What do you use? So, I mean, obviously, you want to just firstly understand how that person thinks about so I, I would ask him many questions on what he's been working on how he believes the swing works so that's just trying to get into a bit of history first um then i put him on the flight scope and i let him hit 25 irons on there um i, I capture i use sports box um 3d it's 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 an unbelievable app where you can take a slow-mo video of the person face on and it changes it into an AI with all the pelvis and chest and hand numbers. Um, so that's been a game changer specifically for online as well because now you can send me a, a face on slow-mo and I can change it to a 3D AI and literally understand exactly how your body is moving. And I just find that a lot more people worldwide have access to flight monitors like the flight scope mevo plus i mean that thing is 42 grand or how many or whatever it costs and historically that you would have had to pay 360 for mm. um you know you know to get that sort of numbers and then i just take some um video capture face on and, and down the line and from behind the person and i really want to just understand by looking at the flight scope numbers what is that player able to do uh, consistently and what are the outlier numbers um, on on his ball and club numbers specifically more club numbers and then I really want to get into it and I really look into the pressure mat numbers how's he so I use body track which gives you the lateral and the vertical forces not so much the rotational forces but you can kind of guesstimate once you have the vertical and the and the lateral force numbers and you really want to just have like the whole story, you know, from start to finish. See like how everything, how everything works to produce the club numbers, and what can you do in its most simplest, in the, in, in the most simplest form, to change the outlier numbers to just get the dispersion a little bit tighter. I think that's really what you're trying to achieve. And I can, I look at all this information. And I cannot teach you all this information. I use this information to try and make the the plan as simple as possible, be it a little grip change, be it a little postural change, be it just a takeaway change. I, I really I, I think that we can only really control the start of the swing and the start of the downswing. Further than that, it's just understanding, like I've said, that it's a downward strike and it's covering the ball more. You know, if you if you've covered those bases, then I think um, you've, you're keeping things simple. And what do you think is the most common flaw or miss for a golfer? Like with me, with fittings, for example, I see nine, eighty to ninety percent miss it right inside open club face lateral movement forward. Yeah, so um, I think it, it's down to posture at the start. I think a lot of people think that your posture needs to be. Um, or your back needs to be very straight, which is something that I just disagree with. Um, I like to see a, a lot more rounded start starting postures so that you can be a lot more, so that your pelvis can be a lot more rotational and your left, your lead pelvis actually works further away from the ball at impact. That to me is the, the, the biggest thing that causes that open club face is just the lack of rotation in the lower body mm -hmm. at impact i mean i was um listening to to joe rogan recently and golf specifically came up and he says that he doesn't want to play golf but not because he can't love it because he thinks he's going to love it too much and he just doesn't have time in his life because he says every friend that takes on golf just gets so sucked up into the game becomes their life and it's something that they absolutely just love 
And <clears throat> when you speak about data, and, and sorry, and, and on that point there about the love of the game, we love this game so much, we spend so much time on it, so much money on it, that it's so good for me. And my philosophy has changed on that entirely. I've never really gone through coaching styles. I recently <clears throat> got a few tips on a few things, and it was amazing what changes it immediately impacted. Mm -hmm. And the call to action for me always with amateurs is that this game that we love and spend so much time on, just go and get the basics right. Simple. Because once you have the basic foundation of what you want to do, you can start to play around with it a little bit on different skills and different outcomes. And it's the game that we love so much, but we also want to be competitive when we play. Mm. We also want to enjoy it. And part of enjoying it is to strike the ball, is to get those good chips onto the green, is to sink those putts. That's part of the chasing that we do. How many people literally when they're playing their four ball has a little internal competition? Oh, it's uh, it's standard. Lunch at halfway it's or standard drinks practice. afterwards or for 100, 100, 200 mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean... For me, I cannot play a, a round of golf without playing for something, whether it's a Coke, or whether it's 100 yeah. Rand, or whether it's for something afterwards. Oh, it's I'll like kissing your sister, isn't it? Correct. <laughs> it's literally, what am I doing here? Because you almost then start fighting against yourself because now it's everything internal. You've got nothing mm. to play for but playing against yourself, Yes. which is sometimes playing against others is a lot more entertaining and a lot more challenging, you know? And then I'm just going to go back two steps, what you guys just discussed on analyzing, creating a profile. I recently learned, and if I'm very behind, excuse me, Augusta, Amen Corner, uh, I think it's the 15th green. Mm -hmm. The par three, am I or right? Par, is par five, so it's... Uh, no, no, but, uh, but then what's the par is three? It is it 16? 16. Yeah. Where they looked at the green, and the green is designed and engineered in such a way that when they put the pin placement on the right. I think you're thinking of 13. Is it 13? 13 with the water short. I remember when we were, is it 13? No, there is a, there is a when, water when on Tiger, it. When Tiger won in 2019, mm -hmm. Finau hit it in the water and Molinari hit it in the water. That hole. Not 16 is the hole uh, in one hole. Okay. okay. 12. The it's 12. 12. My is it 12? My, my, it's my Amen apology. Corner. They, yes. they call yeah. it the Amen Corner. Where everyone was hitting it in the drink. Correct. Correct. Yeah. When, the, when the flag was short right. Yeah. Yes. And just to bring it locally, that's why we call Park View. Is it Park View that we call Amen Corner? When you cross the road, they call that three holes that you go and play there, you know, very similar to the Amen Corner, especially that part three coming back over the water. And I learned for the first time the reason... 99% of pros goes to the left of the green is because there was a design part of it that makes you think, let's say pin to the, to the pin is 176 yards as an example. But what they've learned is, is that it's graded in height differences in such a way that it's almost impossible to go for the flag on the right because the moment you go for the flag on the right, the green becomes something like 3.2 meters for you to land on, still control the ball and get it off. And it's far better just to hit the green on the left because it's a shorter distance to putt mm -hmm. on average. Mm -hmm. You'll know you'll get your par out of it immediately. But that would have never been possible if it wasn't for technology. When he does, but it's almost like the pyramids. And forgive me that I'm going way off here. Please don't go into aliens. No, I won't. <laughs> but it was designed in a time where technology wasn't available. But it was, it's, and now the technology has sort of analyzed that hole. And it's just amazing the people that designed that, where they kept that in mind, where you're going to be tempted to go for the, for the, for the flag on the right. Because the last Sunday is when they put the, mm. the flag on the right. And that wind is so unpredictable. The swirling winds. The swirling winds. What, what you're getting at, at 11 and what you're dealing with at 12 is different. Same golf course, but different winds because of how it tunnels through that golf course. And yes. I think that is also one of the main things. But yeah, I, I mean, that whole Tiger said it many times that if you... If you've hit it close to that pin, you've definitely pushed it. Yeah, yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And now tell me, uh, just as a topical stuff, so the ball debate at the moment... Mm. Do you know about the you know about yeah, the, yeah yeah what's your view on this? Look, I think the long hitters will still be long. Um, Do you think there'll be a bit more skew? I, d I definitely think that there'll be more skew. I think that the outlier good ball strikers will be at, at an advantage, which is 
what it should be. Mm. So I have I I think I agree with Rory on this. Um I think it'll be a good thing. Um will it be a good thing for the whole game to change? No, but you you I don't you know, I don't know if it'll ever actually happen, like Justin Thomas is a heavily against it. But I think that there's going to just be that big difference between the ball speeds the short hitter generates versus the long hitter. Um, that that dispersion is going to be a lot bigger like back in the day where Corey Pavin versus John Daly. You don't have those huge differences on the PGA Tour anymore. If you look at going into the ball, so... 100% of pros don't really pay for balls, right? Yeah. Now, if you have to go back and change the ball, the cost to the manufacturers is going to be huge because they rely on the uh, the average golfer buying golf balls to s- fund pros. No if doubt. If you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So if, they, if everyone had to change their ball plants, like a Callaway or a Titleist and stuff, it would cost millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to do that change with no financial benefit and i know this is going a slight off topic a little bit but Mm. from a business perspective it does not work for the manufacturers no that's what i'm saying yeah if that has to change then whoever changes it whether it's the um, um, pga if they if that's their intention then they need to fund it or if it's the RNA, they need to fund it because pros do not pay for golf balls. Yeah. So it's a very, very... Contentious issue. Huge thing. I do think it'll be good for the game. Um, I think it will... Just bring skills. It back. brings skills, you know. Um, You're going to hit less greens. Correct. And you start seeing shot shaping again like Tiger did back in the day and Seve did back in the day. Mm. For me, that was interesting. You know, um, when you see guys bombing at 360 yards, 400 yards close to the green and chipping and putting all day, for me, it's, yes, it's lo- it's great seeing birdies and eagles. Don't get me wrong. But it does get boring for me. Yeah. I want to see when someone stands on the 18th tee box and he's leading by one, he can have a crappy swing and the ball's going to go straight. You don't see those things anymore. How many times was Ernie or Tiger or Seve or mm-hmm. those guys leading on the last hole and then all of a sudden hit it in the rough behind mm-hmm. a tree or whatnot? You don't see those finishes anymore. It almost You're almost watching someone win the golf tournament easily. Yeah, yeah. You get what I'm saying? It's, it's such a, it's a crazy topic. And every I might get slated for this, but that's my personal view. Um, golf should be interesting enough to watch the good and the bad shots. Yeah. Um, but I do think the ball needs to shape a bit more. So Not I think necessarily it's the distance perspective. I mean, guys are always going to hit it long with club head speed. It's science. But if that ball can shape a bit more, I think it's going to make a lot more interesting viewing. If you see that shot tracer technology going a little hook in the story, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I, I suppose it's a relevant debate in sport at the moment. Formula One is going through the exact same thing and the cap on mm. spend is what they try to do. Mm. Make it competitive for everybody, you know. The Red Bull's got a $500 million budget. Mercedes has got a $500 million budget and then, you know. Aston Martin's got 100 uh, Exactly, he's got $100 million. You know, they've, they've got four times the budget and, and, and they're trying to bring sport to a place where, it, you know, it keeps it interesting. So I, I, I'm not on either side. For me, it's just a weird concept to think that something is going backwards in technology. Mm-hmm. That as a principle, forget any other baits around it. That's a weird concept. And, and I guess if you're going to keep the rest of the game, you know, on the better balls, how do you actually measure whether you're ready to make the change to professional golf? You can't yeah, because you can't. now, let's say you're a top amateur golfer in the country or in college. Now, do you classify for the ball change? And then what are you doing to that person's career who's been using that golf ball for however long and then he needs to make the ball change to professional golf? Now, where's the opportunity in that? Because you're using different equipment. Mm. It's like him 
I guess just us discussing it like this, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm already changing my view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's like you're only allowed to use a persimmon driver when you're an amateur, and then when you get to pro level, yeah. you can use latest technology. But I don't know. Something needs to change for, I don't know. But but where's the cutoff? Because we know that some players are playing with the 2017 Pro V. Some of them are playing with the 2019 Pro V. So it's it's not like so, the moment the 2023 ball comes out, do they just automatically grab them? No, it's no, certainly no. not it's, what it's I see. Based, it's based on personal preference. I yes. mean, we chatted to Thomas Aiken. If he could, he would still use a 2013 Pro V. Correct. It shapes more, probably goes shorter, etc. But he can control the ball a bit better. Yeah. I think all the Pro Vs or whatever balls available yeah. now is in a category. You know, that old technology golf ball has gone yeah. away. So it's much of a muchness. But I tell you what, while I'm sitting here and listening to the two of you that are obviously professionals in your game, it's actually before I even Llewellyn came on, the game and the coaching and everything fitting is changed. Mm. Yeah, you sit here now, you talk about online coaching, you talk about 3D models, and 5D models that are being created AI with apps, technology. AI technology yeah, that are being incredible. enforced. You talk about a launch monitor on top of that to verify certain numbers and give you all sorts of other details that leads to a particular way of coaching. We now talk about <coughs> amateurs understanding that the ball is, is vital. Before the driver and the irons, you need to understand what ball suits the game that you are. But then also, I want to go for a fitting, but is my swing right? Is my foundations or my foundation in my golf right and i mean you turned me away the first time <clears throat> and i've know that you turn customers away that come to you and it's like uh, what, do, what do you want me to, to fit you on just here, so that you understand so what i do is if <coughs> i see there's massive technique issues yeah you can't I'm do fitting fit. the golf club for the technique issues now is your plan to get better from just an equipment point of view or do you want to get better from equipment and a technique point of view? I think, and, and you hit the nail on the head there because I, I, I'm actually seeing one of OG Malefi's foundation kids and this kid is so talented. I actually saw him, yeah. But he was fit for a golf swing that will never work under pressure. And, you know, is he going to be able to reach his goals like that? Um and that's exactly what you just hit the nail. Llewellyn, and thank you very much for today. You know, I, 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 I didn't get to a tenth of the subjects that I wanted to speak to you about, but Arthur and I called it this morning. With somebody with your caliber, it's going to flow. Is there any way, cheekily, I can ask you that the first ten people that make contact with you, that we can give them a discount to come and just try out your coaching? Sure, why don't we call it uh, the Master's Human okay, Discount? Okay, fantastic. So Master's Human Discount, and uh, uh, Ruan will just note that for us. Because here's just my call to action, uh, Arthur, before you close off for us. Just go. And, it, and, and, and Llewellyn would appreciate that I say that. It doesn't have to be Llewellyn. Wherever you are in your area, do a little bit of homework on the coaches that's around you. Go get a foundational lesson mm. once you go into that lesson you 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 for me you don't know what you don't know and when you dive into that i guarantee this to everybody on this i guarantee this you'll have a far better playing experience you'll enjoy the game a lot more and when you go to a coach as a reference point when you do get sucked into the youtube channels and the tips you also understand that a lot better mm. and where to call and where not to call I would go a step further and say that if you have a, if you're going to go to a coach that has a TPI certification, you're in good hands. Okay, that's they, wonderful. They understand the body with a golf club with and how to use the technology. Correct. Yeah, I think to finish off, I think the mo moral of the story is uh, for us, all three of us, is just education. Yeah, I yeah. think whether it's golf technology whether it's equipment whether it's coaching i think the educational element to it is huge i mean that's why we're here sitting here today speaking about golf and have a golf show is to actually educate the golf community mm. the consumers you know make golf a lot more enjoyable because it's enjoyable already 
but there's f a lot of information out there that will make i've seen so many people that used to enjoy this game <coughs> that just simply received some bad coaching mm. and they don't play anymore and and that shouldn't happen in the happen. future yeah no I agree with that. And the game is developing. And I, I tell you, Arthur, as I'm sitting here, we spend so many hours on golf. You know, we also get home and we're watching all sorts of stuff that doesn't feed our brains necessarily. And I understand, especially for men, like you said, when you got home last night after 16 lessons with a, a back that's out, you know, we go into our nothing boxes. We just want nothing for nothing. Switch off time. For, th for half an hour, an hour. And I, you know, like the stuff that I sometimes go into and watch, it's, it's supposed to make me feel dumber because I just want to be in my nothing box. We never ask as a call to action on this show. But please take a minute, take a f this 55 minutes or an hour and five minutes, whatever it's going to be, to listen. Because if you invest in this game, this conversation is going to change your environment immediately. It's going to open your eyes to what's around you. It's going to change your mind as to what you need to do in your game of golf to improve it. Because mm -hmm. simply rocking up with your mates every weekend, doing the exact same thing, is certainly not taking us anywhere forward. You don't just get better. There has to be technology or a coach or a reference points that you need to work from. It doesn't just happen in our minds. I think, I mean, uh, I said it to a client yesterday, you know, when I, when I can see that you have m taken some action to change what you just did wrong and it actually makes a difference to the ball flight, then I know you do know what you're doing. But if you keep bashing your head with the same information and you keep getting the same result, you hit it in the wrong direction. You know, I say if you look at a digital perspective, what you think you know digitally now, two weeks from now, is just out of the window. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the way that the golf game is going, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your view, the shaft changes, the head changes, the loft changes, the grip changes that are I coming mean, did in. Did you the see ball. what Carl Berkshire was able to do the other day? I saw that. 165 that. mile per hour covered yep. speed yep. that translated to just shy of 240 mile per hour ball speed. Correct. I mean, Correct. Absolutely that, phenomenal. That is incredible. It's phenomenal, but <clears throat> but even that is so important to understand that he's conditioned his body to get to that. If he didn't have the body conditioning, but he, as he you had said, no chance. the technology, the shafts that he's using, absolutely, is uh, not your everyday shaft that you no. can pick off the shelf. No, it's certainly not. And also, that's a perception that you know, and that's why the game of golf. Be, we must bring it closer to amateurs where they understand the techniques and the tools that they have. To this day, I hear about people walking into and saying, can I get the Bryson driver? I'm using him as now as an example. You don't understand what you say when you, when you mm -hmm. ask that. 17 people behind him, physical coaches, mental coaches. No, I mean, the list crazy. goes endless for him to get to that particular type of club. You know, and this is so true what you said there, Arthur. We really want amateurs to understand this game a lot more. I'm learning so much when I do all of this. And hopefully that grows the games and makes it more interesting mm. for us. So thank you for your time today, um, Llewellyn. And Arthur, as always, my partner, thank you for sitting with me.